Welcome to Unbossed, Unbothered, and Unfiltered. I am your host, Lauren Green. Join me this season as we discuss the political news of the day, the issues that matter to you, and the impact all of it has on our future. I'm glad you're here. Let's dive in. Hello, and welcome to Unbossed, Unbothered, and Unfiltered. I'm your host, Lauren Green. Like many of you, I was glued to my TV last week watching the DNC, seeing um, all the hope and joy and the roll call, uh, all of the things that, that honestly made it clear how excited so many people are in order to um, have the opportunity to elect Vice President Harris. I personally really enjoyed uh, Lil John's appearance for Georgia. I also really appreciated Beyonce being played for Texas Hold'em. Um, so it, it was a really uh, fun reminder of when America shows up at its best, what it can look like when we lean in to our diversity, when we decide that we're going to be the best of ourselves. Um, Michelle Obama reminding um, th that reminding us all that being president is a black job is something I, I will always appreciate. The Obamas um, have a way of galvanizing the base of exciting people. That's frankly, it, if I can be honest, it's informed my politics across my life since I started paying attention to politics for so much um, of what I do. And so I, I will always love the Obamas. I'm always excited to see when they show up. And so having them at the DNC and to deliver the powerhouse speeches they gave was so, so inspiring. I was also moved, like so many of you were, I'm sure, by the Walls family. This is our first time meeting them. Know that I am actively not adding a T to that man's name. I have called them the Waltzes so many times. They are the Walls. Um, and I will remember that <laughs> moving forward. Um, but again, to see the love and excitement they share, to see how excited they were to be there. I do think the way that your family speaks about you is is an important marker of who you are as a person, honestly, in any walk of life. And so to have um, Governor Wall's family speak so highly of him and be responding so much in real time, along with Doug to stand on stage and speak so highly of VP Harris and their children and have uh, his ex-wife in attendance. I thought all of it was a beautiful, beautiful testament to how loved and invested uh, the presidential and vice presidential candidate are in this season. And I don't think that's something that can ever be taken for granted, especially when we know that, uh, needless to say, the other side's families don't reference them in that way. Melania borderline refuses to be in the same room with Trump and his kids, frankly, are a joke. So it it really made it uh, uh, to see the casting side by side of the DNC being a space that invokes and holds on to family, that holds on to faith, that holds on to happiness and joy and future and patriotism. The amount of American flags, the chanting USA, the signs that said freedom. So much of that, I think, was directly targeting um what people have thought Democrats are and who people have uh, unfortunately written us off to be. In the event that you believe that freedom uh, means that the government should be in your medical office, like maybe you should reevaluate freedom. So there's there's a real a real excitement and a real investment that I don't think can be ignored. Um, so that was a great, a great, sort of not quite kickoff, but, you know, additional boost for the Harris campaign that was super exciting. Now, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge a critique from me uh, regarding the DNC would be that I believe that the Palestinian uh, community deserved to be represented on stage. I believe they should have allowed them to speak, especially because, like, the ceasefire lines throughout the convention received resounding applause. Uh, even in VP Harris's speech, it was her largest applause line of the night. I heard, um, you know, of course, ignoring the standing ovation when she comes in and when she leaves, like people really responded to that. And so to constantly be referencing it on stage, but not let the people who have made that their political identity speak, I think shows a bit of cognitive dissonance. 
However, I do think overall the uh, convention showed how much the party has rallied behind Harris and how, like, just frankly, the excitement that was missing from the race prior. Um, unfortunately, what is happening at the same time and what today's episode is about is what's effectively kind of the opposite of that. For those of you who do not pay attention to right-wing media, right-wing um, conservative Christian uh, engagement, there is something going on right now called the Courage Tour. Uh, the Courage Tour, if you can't gauge by its uh, name, is a Honestly, just take a look. One of the interesting things about the Courage Tour is that we're unashamed about the role of the body of Christ in the affairs of planet Earth. You see, we've been so trained to think about all we're doing here is get saved, hang on, and then go to heaven. We don't realize that the ultimate role of Jesus is to come back to Earth to rule it. And when he comes back, he's going to be administrating his affairs over nations with people that get it, meaning they understand that he is a ruler who rules. The Courage Tour is a unique alchemy. It's one of the few times when you're going to have election integrity, understanding how to vote, understanding how the state works, understanding stewardship and occupying Michigan for the kingdom of God. And then you can easily transition right from there into Jesus in the city, Jesus in the streets, worship, evangelism, and healing. How, where in the world do you have the kingdom of God so comfortably folded and naturally folded into ruling on planet Earth? You have it in the Bible and you have it in the Courage Tour. So here's my challenge for you. All of us are going to be invited to rule in the new administration. You want to be on the left hand and the right hand of Jesus. You want to be close to his administration. The great reward in the next age isn't mansions. It isn't gold. It isn't endless hedonistic pleasures and delights. It's proximity to the power that rules the universe. Yeah. So um, that is also going on at the same time as something like the DNC. It's been going across the country um, on some type of revival uh, type tour. And so it's frankly disheartening uh, to see um, people who call themselves Christians rallying like that. Uh, something I was personally really moved by was the amount that faith was on display for the DNC, the amount that people leaned in to their faiths and different types of faiths and the way that it shows up. Uh, so often in the decisions we make and who we vote for to hear people speak with so much passion about what they feel God has called them to do. Um, as a Christian, I've always let my faith lead my politics to the best way that I knew how. And so to see that actually be embraced, to have the Democrats not seed faith as something that is inherently right wing or the talk of faith to be sort of shunned, I was really excited to see the way that people were able to do that especially because we see the balance that that's going to be with the other side, obviously um, using that to rally people. Part of what a lot of this rhetoric is, is leaning into apocalyptic um, end times type of jargon. And one of the people doing it, uh, frankly, at an alarming rate in the way that it impacts our political process is someone whose name I did not know prior to this, uh, prior to the research and paying attention to everything going on. But his name is Joshua Standifer, and he leads an organization called Lion of Judah that believes it's time for Christians led by the Holy Spirit taking back the mountain of government and transforming our nation. The reason why Standifer is sort of catching my eye and my attention right now are because of some remarks that he gave at the Courage Tour most recently that make clear uh, some of the actions that uh, the right is going to take in order to, um, frankly, sow discord and discontentment after this election. I promised you guys an action plan on how to do it. And we spent months calculating and creating, meeting with experts, something that we felt like could take Christians and put them in a place of influence. Just imagine, it's election night. Chaos is happening. 
the polls are closing. They go and the, the volunteers are getting kicked out. But what if we had Christians across America and swing states like Wisconsin that were actually the ones counting the votes and making sure it was happening? So I want to introduce you to our program called Fight the Fraud, How to Become an Election Worker in Four Easy Steps. Now, this program right here, it takes 15 minutes. And it doesn't matter if you struggle with technology or if you're like absolutely awesome at it. It's super easy to do. And here's the cool thing about it. A lot of people don't realize this, but in Wisconsin, you can get paid to be an election worker. So listen, are you guys ready to make a difference? Are you guys ready to get off the sidelines and make history this November? All right, everybody get your phone ready. I see some are jumping the gun, but look, I've got a QR code for you right here. This is totally free. Everything we do, we're a 501c4 nonprofit. This is a free course. And the cool thing about it is that in 15 minutes, all you do is step one, register to vote. Are you, and if you're not, we help you register. Step two, you select your state. And then after you select your state, we connect you with your local municipality to apply to be an actual election worker. Now, if you're wondering, well, I'm a poll watcher or a volunteer, here's the difference. At election night, what happens is when the polls start to close or chaos unfolds, they're going to kick the volunteers out. You are actually going to be a paid election worker. You're going to be trained by your local municipality. I call this our Trojan horse in. They don't see it coming, but we're going to flood election uh, poll stations across the country with spirit-filled believers. For accessibility reasons, I will have the transcript of what was said linked in the show notes. But that is incredibly concerning. Incredibly concerning that they are already uh, prepared and mobilizing people to undermine our election, to undermine our democracy, to intentionally sow seeds of discontentment, to encourage people uh, to be poll workers is is one thing, but for the purposes of pursuing Christian values or what they're calling Christian values is actually uh, pretty terrifying. Pretty terrifying. I don't know what the next steps around that will be. Um, but I do think that to be on tour encouraging people to undermine democracy is something that should alarm a lot of people. Uh, this is on top of other right-wing um, professed Christian influencers who are uh, who had a host of comments to make about the DNC. I'm not going to bother playing those. Um, I don't believe in giving those uh, airtime, but I do think that there is something to be said for this rallying around a uh, particular straight white Jesus that is going to be a warrior for your causes and beliefs. So much of what Jesus stood for was none of that. But on top of everything else going on, to have Democrats bring forward faith in this moment, I think was really critical and really strategic and really important. I would like to see that embraced more on the campaign trail. One of the things that was interesting about Vice President Harris was that her and her husband are, are different faiths. I think that's really important. While I enjoyed so much of the um, excitement and positivity and hope and joy around the DNC and want that to continue, it cannot be overstated that we cannot, um, frankly, ignore these people into oblivion. We cannot pretend like they're going away. We cannot think that even though, um, you know, we, that Democrats are positive and excited, that that is going to be enough to take the momentum uh, all the way across the finish line. And even once we get to the finish line, it's clear that they're prepared to move past that in order to um, make sure they get the results that they want. And so we cannot stop short. This is not just about voting. There has to be a level of intentional engagement around the issues, intentional uh, dissuading 
of of family members a level of actual engagement that I think is is more important than at least I realized in previous elections. Based on the track record, uh, Vice President Harris is not going to need to just win. She's not going to need to just get more votes than her opponent. Sure, we all understand how the Electoral College works, but even if we just look at our most recent presidential elections, in 2016, uh, Secretary Clinton won by 2 million, somewhere between 2 million and 3 million votes um, as far as getting the popular vote, but she lost the Electoral College. In 2020, Vice President Biden won by 10 million of the popular votes, but it took us almost a week, I think it was five days, to certify the election. So I think we should fully be prepared coming into this one, to not have an answer on election night and to acknowledge that sort of a sweeping, deafening, overwhelming victory, that there will be a lot of contention around this election. People are going to fight back. There will clearly be plants in poll workers. There will clearly be uh, people with agendas out to undermine the election, out to ensure that, um, out to ensure, frankly, chaos, frankly, anarchy. And we can't let that depress us. We have to allow that to be something that we keep in the back of our mind as we continue pushing forward, as we continue pushing our issues, as we continue pushing our agendas. They are currently in conversations about the debates between mics and hot mics and whether there's going to be any. And all of that is, is stuff for the campaigns to decide. But as the voters, as consumers of media, as people who are engaged and aware, it's going to be really, really important that we make sure that we do everything we can to save our democracy, that we leave it all on the field. Also, understanding that doesn't guarantee victory, but there honestly is no other option. This is not about um, just excitement around VP Harris. This is not just about excitement around the first woman of color at the top of a ticket. This is actually about ensuring that we ever have other elections. This is about making sure that certain people in this country, some who look like me and some who don't, are safe, are able to work and play in the ways that they have become accustomed, as anybody should be able to in this country. It's been very um, disheartening to see faith weaponized on the right the way that it has been. It has been very scary to watch people who profess to be the same faith as you actively support and be willing to strategize and coordinate with someone who really truly does not believe in your humanity. That's not something to take lightly. It's not something to pretend like goes away after election day one way or the other. But it is something to fight and to continue to fight. The life and times of Jesus Christ. The life and death of Jesus Christ. Make clear that something very dangerous happens when religious leaders coordinate with the government. When religious leaders use their um, titles, their power, their perceptions to target marginalized people. And again, whether it's done in the name of Christ or done in the name of anyone else. And so as we move forward in this election season, I know that we cannot understate how much is at stake, but faith is on the line too. We cannot allow these people to be the poster children of what it means to have a connection of God. We cannot allow them to be the only representation of what being religious means. 
One, because they don't mean it. And two, because it's not true. I serve a God of love, justice, liberation, peace. And to see warmongers and hateful people do so in the name of the person who told us to love our neighbors actively does not translate for me. And frankly, I refuse. I refuse to be engaged with it. I refuse to let them have the God and the faith and the sustenance that I need. No, we do not cede this to you. You are not, as we move into this next chapter, so much of the country doesn't even pay attention to elections until after Labor Day. And so for people who have, you know, made this a uh, career, for people who have eaten and drank and slept politics, it's like, what do you mean? Yeah, the average person who gets up and goes to work every day does not pay attention to electoral politics until after Labor Day. And so there is a mad dash to define yourself as a candidate, to define your campaign, to continue uh, hammering your message over and over from now until November, and even after, because clearly there uh, will be some issues to follow. And so that's our show. If you're looking for me, you can find me at Miss Lauren D. Green on Twitter and Instagram. And if you're looking for the show, you can find us at Unbossed, Unbothered, and Unfiltered.com. That was this episode of Unbossed, Unbothered, and Unfiltered. If you want to hear more of the show, visit Unbossed, Unbothered, and Unfiltered.com. If you want to reach me, find me on Twitter and Instagram at Miss Lauren D. Green. Hope to hear from you soon.